uh, I'm going to be talking about something uh, that does exist that today and sort of some of the things about it that I find interesting. Um, and so the title of the talk is, What's in a Plan? How did it get there anyway? Um, and by a plan, I actually mean the data structure whose name is capital P, small l, small a, small n. So many of you are probably thinking, well, I know how to see the information that's in a plan. You just run explain, and you run the query, and it prints everything out. And you're kind of right. But it turns out that explain might be slightly lying to you. So uh, that's one of the things that you'll sort of see as a little bit of a recurring theme as we go through these slides. So since I'm talking about uh, the data structure, the plan data structure, in one sense, the, the question, what's in a plan, is that stuff. <laughs> Talk over, closing session, uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to just group these fields into a couple of categories, and I'm going to go through e each category individually. I want to mention that on many of the slides throughout this talk, I've got either explain output or uh, C code taken from the PostgreSQL source code. Uh, in many of those cases, I have made cosmetic changes to make it fit on the slide better. Um, so I don't think that uh, those changes are of a nature that will confuse anybody or uh, certainly not mislead. Uh, but if the output that you see here doesn't exactly match what you see in the source tree, that, that's the reason. So uh, actually, I'm not quite correct when I say that this is the stuff in the plan. This is the type def struct plan definition from plan nodes.h. But actually, this is only the common information that appears in every kind of plan. So this plan structure is embedded in some larger structure that has additional uh, fields that depend on what kind of plan node this is. So it might be a sort, or a sequential scan, or an index scan, or a gather node, or, or whatever. Um, and so there are going to be additional fields that are effectively beyond the end of this structure that pertain to whatever specific kind of plan uh, you've got. And the way that you know what kind of plan you've got is that the very first field of the plan is node tag type. And I'm not going to talk further about the node tag, except to say that it's a giant enum uh, that tells you what kind of plan you've actually got. And I'm also basically not going to talk very much at all about any of the node type specific data. So I'm just going to focus on the common structural information that's part of every plan node. So we can break that up into a couple of categories. There's the node tag, which I just mentioned. Uh, there's some costing information, some things related to parallel query support. Uh, there's a target list and something called a qual, uh, left and right subtrees, and I think those things, the target list, the qual, and the left and right subtrees, those are really kind of the meat of this. Um, and then there's a list of init plans. There's two fields called ext param and all param, and if you have no idea what those fields store, you're not the only one. <laughs> and then there's the type-specific information. So if you think about it, in one sense, it's a little strange that we store costing information uh, in the plan. Because actually, the way that planning happens in PostgreSQL is we first start by generating paths, which are, in a sense, candidate plans. And then we pick the cheapest one, and we convert that into a final plan. So why do we need the costing information? We already know that this one was the cheapest one. Otherwise, we would have thrown it away. So that's kind of an interesting question. Um, I'll talk about <laughs> the, the big answer, of course, is explain, right? We, we like to be able to run explain and actually see the costing information. And if we threw it away, then we wouldn't have it. It's actually used uh, in a few other places as well. And I'll show that on the next slide. Um, but there are four fields that pertain to this in the plan data structure. There's the startup cost, the total cost. And the startup cost means the amount of effort in abstract cost units that will be required to generate the first tuple. And then the total cost is the effort to generate all the tuples. Uh, then we have an estimate of the number of rows that this plan node will produce, which as you can see is actually a double value, not an integer. Um, 
And uh, then we have the plan width in bytes per row. Again, estimated. Why number of hotels because of that one? Um, because we do a lot of uh, floating point math when we're estimating things, and we don't want to throw away the precision. Actually, we do throw away the precision in a lot of places, but, but not everywhere. Um, also, the other advantage of the double is you can represent numbers which are really, really big using the double, like bigger than 4 billion. So how does this uh, get used? Uh, explain is a big one. If you run explain, you see all that stuff. Um, there's a few other places where this gets used in the executor. If we're building some kind of a hash table, specifically if we're doing a hash join or a, a, a hash sub plan, the row count and the width are used to set the initial size of the hash table, which is not totally critical, but getting that approximately right at the beginning makes things slightly more efficient. Um, for a hash join, we use this information to decide whether or not we should fetch the first outer tuple before building the hash table or after building the hash table. And the, the reason why that's important is because it might turn out that one of the inputs to the hash join is empty. If we try to pull the first tuple that's going to have to be probed into the hash table and we don't get one, then we can completely skip building the hash table. Um, on the other hand, if we try to pull the first row that goes into the hash table and we don't get one, then we can also skip building the hash table and we can skip generating any row from the other side. So we actually use the cost to decide which of those two optimizations to try. There's a plan shape called alternative sum plan where we actually generate two different plans for a sub plan. How many people have actually ever seen an alternative sub plan? Is that a question or you've seen one? You've seen one. OK, yeah, few people. There's, one, there's a couple of examples in the regression tests. That's the only place where I've ever seen an alternative <laughs> subplan, but apparently they happen. It uh, makes confusing when it happens because you, you don't notice that it's alternative in the first place. So you're like, why are you doing this one twice? Yeah. Um, so then, and we also use this to d decide between custom plans and uh, generic plans. OK, I've got to speed up. So parallel query, there are basically three fields here for parallel query. There's a field called parallel aware, which answers the question, does this plan node know anything specifically about parallelism? A parallel safe flag, meaning could this part of the plan potentially be executed in a worker, or can it only be safely executed in the leader process? Um, and there's a plan node ID. And to understand why a couple of these fields are here, I've just got some very simple examples of plans. Um, so in this, pl in this first plan that I have here on the slide, we've got a gather node on top of a merge join. And then the merge join is a parallel index scan on A and an index scan on B. So both of those are index scans. But the parallel aware flag is set on the first one. And what that means is that the rows in A are going to be divided between all of the participants in the parallel phase of the operation. Whereas for B, since the parallel aware flag is not set on the plan, every uh, participant is going to see every row. And if you think about it, that is 100% necessary for correctness. Because if you have some workers compare a subset of the rows in A to everything in B, and then another worker compares a different subset of A to everything in B, and so on, you will get the right answer. If you take random sets of subsets of A and compare them with random subsets of B, that won't work. <laughs> and we have to know which, so we have to know which, which one of those things we're doing. So that's the need for the parallel aware flag. The plan node ID is necessary because of plans like this. Here we have a gather on top of an append with three parallel sex scans underneath. In each of these parallel sex scans, we need to divide the rows between all of the workers. And for that to happen, the workers have to talk to each other. But about what? They need to know some way to identify which plan node uh, they are talking about. And the plan node ID serves that function. Uh, you could say, well, why not do it by table ID? But it turns out you can reference the same table multiple times in the same query. And so the OID can be there more than once. The plan node ID is unique. This could maybe be used for things besides parallel query, but right now, not so much. OK, so now we kind of get to the heart of this, or the start of the heart of it. Uh, we've got the target list, which is the 
things that this node is going to produce. PostgreSQL has a, a kind of volcano style executor where tuples start at the bottom of the, of the tree and they percolate up the tree and then they explode out the top. There's actually a, there's actually a system called Volcano and I think it's called Volcano because its executor works that, that way as well. Um, then there's a qual. Uh, so the qual is actually something that is a bunch of filter conditions that apply to this node. One or more filter conditions that apply to this node. So that's a list of expressions Anything that doesn't match any tuple that, is pr that would be produced by this node, but which fails to match those expressions, gets thrown out. And then we have a left and a right subtree for the plant. So here's an example of what this looks like in the explain output. Um, you can see here that the, the merge jo left join, which is at the top of this plant tree, uh, has uh, a an output row in the explain verbose output. It's shown in gold here. And th that, um, that node is producing a.q2 and b.q1. That's the format of the tuples that it's producing. So that's the target list. The filter condition, which you see there, is the qual. That's what's being tested uh, at, at the very end before we admit the tuple. You notice this node also has type, a type-specific expression, a merge condition. And that's something that's sort of part of the join processing itself. That's part of the way that a merge join works. But then whatever the merge join actually produces, we apply this filter to it afterward and throw away anything that doesn't match. And then this plant has a left tree, which is shown here in blue, and a right tree, which is shown here in purple. Not all of these fields are actually used for every node. For example, the sequential scans that appear on this plant have neither a left tree nor a right tree, because they have no descendant nodes. The sort has a left tree, but no right tree, because it only has one child. So what happens here? Here I have an append node with four sequential scans underneath. A left tree, right tree, center left tree, center right tree. So what are the left tree and the right tree in this example? Anybody know? They're nil, right? So there are a number of nodes that can have sort of an infinite list of children, and those nodes have the children in a, a, a flexible-sized list of children that is part of the node type-specific data, and they leave the re left and right trees completely empty and explain lies to you and it makes it look exactly the same as the other case, but, it, but it's not. When you use a subquery in your query and you don't put it in the from clause, then you get these things called init plans and subplants. Um, and I've written an example here. Um, in the where clause, I have select, I have where f1 equals select min of abs of f1 from int4 table. And that turns into an init plan, init plan 2 here. Um, and there's a plan associated with that that computes the value. And then I also have another subquery in the target list where I say select odd from 10k1, where unique 1 equals f1. And that turns into a subplan. And the difference to condense a very complicated topic down to a few words in a slightly misleading way that omits some important details is that the init plan at one, and only needs to be computed once whereas the subplan needs to be re-executed for every row. So naturally, uh, if we're going to have init plans and subplans attached to plan nodes, there must be a list of each of these things associated with the plan node, right? No, wrong. There's a list of init plan nodes associated with each plan node, but there's no list of subplans. The subplan nodes just appear in the expressions that are attached to the node, the filter condition, the merge condition, whatever it is. Uh, and the executor, when it starts up, builds a list of all of the ones that it finds while it's walking down the execution state tree. And explain shows it that, that to you, and it also shows you the init plan exists, which actually does exist in the plan. Yeah. Join with the outer 
Yeah, if it referred to the outer copy of the table, you'd end up with a subplan rather than an init in it, in it plan. Right, which is why it couldn't be an init plan. It would have to be a subplan. But here it only gets executed once, and we end up with an init plan. Um, now, you may have noticed also on this slide, we have this thing where it says init plan 2 returns dollar sign $1. What's dollar sign $1? Well, dollar sign $1 is a parameter. Um, so basically, uh, there are these two fields, x param and all param, which are associated with every plan node. And they're basically the same thing. They're like 95% the same thing. They tell you which parameters that plan node cares about. The only difference is, if a plan node has an init plan attached, the output parameters, the parameters that the init plan sets, get included in all param, but are excluded from x param. I have yet to figure out exactly why we do it this way. Um, <laughs> so here's an example of a case where x param is empty and all param is not empty. This is a really useful query from the regression tests. Uh, select 1 equals all of select of select 1. Uh, and it ends up producing this plan. Um, and as you can see, the materialized node here has an init plan attached. That init plan returns dollar sign zero. So the all param set of the materialized node includes parameter zero, but the x param set is empty because the parameters set by init plans are excluded as a special case. All param is used at execution time to decide which nodes to reset when we need to rescan. So for example, if we sorted some data and we looked at the output of the sort, and then we need to look at the output of the sort again, there are two things we can do. One is, if we still have the results of the previous sort, we can just return those results over again. Like if we sort it in memory and the sorted data is still in memory, we can just back up to the beginning and return all the same results over again. The other thing we could do is we could throw away the sorted data that we already have rerun the portion of the plan that generated that data, sort everything again, and then return those rows. Obviously, the first one is cheaper, but it only makes sense if the input to the sort hasn't changed. Because if some parameter value has changed that changes the input to the sort, you can't just reuse the results, because now everything's different. That was probably totally confusing. Uh, so you can see here, like in this sequential scan, if somehow, we haven't gotten to how this can happen yet, if somehow the value of dollar sign one changed, then the results of this sequential scan would also change. Because the sequential scan has a filter condition that says that F1 has to be equal to dollar sign one. So if you change dollar sign one somehow, don't worry about how that could happen, uh, in this example, it can't. But if somehow dollar sign one changed, then the output of the sequential scan changed. If there were a sort node on top of it, every time dollar sign one changed, the output of the sequential scan would change, the output of the sort would change, so you'd have to redo the sort with the new set of input rows. OK, so the executor turns out to rely on x param as well as all param, but only barely. Uh, there's only there are, the only thing that the executor does at runtime with x param is test whether it's empty. Um, and it only does that in like one corner case. So the only query in the entire regression test suite where the fact that we have both x param and all param in the finished plan makes any difference to what happens at execution time is this one that I showed you on the previous slide. That's the only case where it makes any difference whether we have x param or all param. I'm pretty sure it would work if we tested all param, but it would like use a few extra CPU cycles. 
So actually, having both x param and all param in the final plan isn't really pulling its weight, as far as I can tell. I think the main reason we actually have both of these is because they're used when we're assembling the final plan. We incrementally convert the paths that we generate into plans. And in that process of building up the final plan, we end up using both of these sets in the calculations. But in the final plan, it all, the distinction between the two almost doesn't matter. So parameters are pretty important. Everybody see the parameter in this plan? Anybody see the parameter in this plan? Yeah, where is it? Yeah, it's, the, it's this int4 table.f1. That's actually a parameter. So how many nodes in this plan have a non-empty all param set? Which nodes in, somebody said two, which two? The two index scans, close but no cigar. Also the append. The append depends on dollar sign zero. Because if you change the value of dollar sign zero, clearly the index scans are going to produce different results because you've changed which value you're looking for. But also, that means the append is going to produce a different result. So it's like, it's like that. So we don't see the. In this case, it's the nested loop that's generating the dollar sign zero parameter. And that dollar sign zero parameter is being used to communicate between the sequential scan on int4 table, which is on one side of the nested loop, with the index scans on t3i that are on the other side of the nested loop. So as we read each row from int4 table, the nested loop stuffs that value into a parameter called dollar sign zero. And then when we do the index scans, we use that value of dollar sign zero to drive the index scan so that we get the right rows. Is the parameter the or is it F1? It's just F1. Yeah, you, you, I mean, I think you can construct a query where you end up stuffing a whole tuple into a parameter. But in the normal case, you just put in the column value that you need. OK, so now I'd like to visit, explain, revisit the topic of explain versus reality uh, to this point in the talk. So parallel safe is not displayed. A plan node idea is not displayed. Pla init plans and subplans are displayed in the same way, but only init plans are really attached in the way that they're displayed. X param and all param are not displayed, although the init plan display lets you infer something about them especially if you also know how nested loops and other part of the planner, or parts of the planner work. But it's tricky. You can't entirely see what's going on there. These are the small lies. <laughs> OK. These are the small things that it's hiding. It's not the whole truth. So where we really get into large lies, in my opinion, is when we come to expressions. The way that expressions are represented here is totally unlike what is actually stored in the plan in some of these cases. And there are sort of hints of that in this display. Like if you look at this nested loop join here, you see that the second output column is the constant 666. If you go up one level, it's now parenthesized 666. Where did the parentheses come from? What's going on here, right? And there's other things about it that will start to bother you if you spend as much time looking at plans as I do, which maybe you shouldn't, because then you might end up giving a talk like this. <laughs> The sequential scan on the int4 table i1 produces as output i1.f1. 
And that sequential scan, I think we can all feel confident to say that that sequential scan really has access to the value of i1.f1. It's scanning that table. But this nested loop here, how does it have access to i1.f1? It, it, it's not touching the table. It's just a nested loop. So of course, the answer is that things bubble up, right? It's a volcano-style executor. Things bubble up. So 666 bubbles up, and i1 bubbles up. And all of the things that start at the inner layers of the plant tree actually move outward and eventually get to the top of the plant tree, or else they get filtered out and they don't. So here's a more intellectually honest representation of this plan. So down here at the bottom, this is the thing we talked about before with nested loops. We're not really comparing i2.unique1 to i1.f1 directly. We're really comparing it to this dollar sign zero parameter, which got populated over here, which makes sense. This is a scan on, uh, this is a scan on uh, i2, so it's not a scan on i1. So it has to get the value from i1 from someplace, and, and it gets it from the parameter. But also, in this display, you can see how the information is bubbling up to the higher, level of, higher levels of the plan. We can see here that it's actually this nested loop left join that first produces the value 666. That's where the 666 really comes from. The higher levels of the plan aren't producing 666. They're just passing through what they got from the lower levels of the plan. So you can see that the materialized nodes output is just the two columns that it gets from its outer subplan, which is the nested loop left join. So the nested loop left join produces uh, two columns, one of which it takes from its own outer subplan, and the other of which is a constant that it generates. And then those two columns, once they've been produced, get passed up to the materialized node, and it just passes through those same two columns. It takes the first and second column of its outer input. Um, and then when you go up and you look at the very top of the plan, which I can't reach because I'm too short, um, you have the join filter, which is comparing the first column of the outer tuple to the first column of the inner tuple. It doesn't have any direct access to the underlying tables. It doesn't know what underlying, it doesn't really know what underlying tables produce those values. It just knows that it, the value scan and the materialized node handed it these tuples. And it looks at the first column of each one and compares them to see whether that join filter condition passes. If it does, then it produces an output tuple. And that, someone has a laser pointer. Um, um, if it does, um, then what happens is, uh, I don't know how to use it. Uh, I do. So if it does, then it assembles a new output tuple. So it takes the first column from its outer tuple, which corresponds to what was originally values.column1. And then it takes the first and second columns from the plan on the inner side, which is this materialized node. So you can see how the data is flowing up the plan tree through the, what I've labeled here as inner and outer references. And when the data flow is, some way, is, is in some direction other than straight up, then it goes by way of these parameters. The parameters allow us to sort of pass data sideways or in strange ways through the plan tree. And everything else is just bubbling up. So the explain output runs around and tells you where the values came from originally. In the actual explain output, we have values.column1 because that value originally came from the value scan uh, and the column one of the value scan. And i1.f1 originally came from the i1 table, um, and, uh, uh, and it was produced by the sequential scan, and it bubbled up here. And this 666 here originally came from this 666 here. But because of some idiosyncrasy of the deparsing code, it, it gets parentheses around it when it's bubbling up. But internally, uh, when we're executing this, uh, we, 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 we're not really doing it that way. Explain has kind of masked the real data flow here a little bit. Um, and one thing that I think is kind of interesting about this is that when we initially generate paths, the references to the table columns, which internally are called bar nodes, um, and also references to expressions in the target list, 
in the initial phases of planning, uh, those still refer to the table that will really provide the value. So when we're initially doing the planning, the data structures that we're generating actually look very much like the final explain output. But at the very end of the planning process, after we've figured out how we're finally going to execute this thing, we no longer care about the original origin of the value. We need to know where the plan node that's running is going to get the value at execution time. Is it coming from the outer plan? Is it coming from the inner plan? Is it coming from a parameter? W where is it coming from? And so one of the last stages of planning is to go through uh, uh, and run through the plan and to replace vars and expressions with new vars that refer to the outer or inner plan. And that produces uh, this kind of thing, which is what the data structure really looks like internally. I was behind, now I'm a little ahead. So that's actually uh, all I've got on what's in a plan. We have a few minutes, so I can take a few questions if anyone wants to ask a question. I'm going to go with no. <laughs> the question is, can I get a summary of this non-technically? <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah. Do you have the query that generated the plan that we were just spending a lot of time on? Yes, so that query, I don't think I have it handy, but you can find this in the regression tests, okay. because this came straight out of the regression test. Yeah, Greg. It's Ah, okay, so, you, yeah, so you have encountered something called the use physical t-list optimization, or sometimes the use physical t-list de-optimization. <laughs> so, so what happens is uh, the way that the data is actually passed up the plan tree is in something, using something called a tuple table slot. And a tuple table slot can hold the, the data for a tuple in one of several different formats. And if we're doing something like a sequential scan, the easiest thing to do is actually cram the entire tuple with all of its columns directly into the tuple table slot and let the next node up just get all of the columns and then only pull out the ones that it needs. So if we determine that uh, that optimization makes sense in a particular case, then the sequential scan will be seen to output every single column in the table, and at the next level, those columns will be projected away. If we determine that the optimization isn't a good idea in a certain case, then we'll make the sequential scan do the extra work of pulling a tuple apart, pulling out the stuff we need, and only passing things up that we need. For example, if there's a sort directly on the top of the sequential scan, we don't want the sort to get all the columns because then we'd be sorting really wide data instead of hopefully narrow data and that would stink. So in that case, we'll tell the sequential scan, I'm sorry, you have to give us exactly the columns that we really need. But when we don't care, we'll say to the sequential scan, hey, if you want to just produce everything, that'll be fine with us, we'll deal with it at the next level. So projection is reconstructing a new tuple? Right, projection is reconstructing a new tuple. Projection can involve computing expressions, uh, throwing away columns. Peter? Yeah, do you think it would make sense to have a mode in an explain to show this other format that we showed for account? Yeah, I, I, I had thought of the same thing myself. I think having like a raw option for explain or something we can bike chat about the name, but I think having a name that displays uh, some of these internal details. It would be really helpful, at least for developers, because it took me a long time to actually understand some of what was going on here, and there's bits and pieces of it that I'm still not sure I fully understand. But I definitely have had cases when I was working on parallel query where I was like, wait, which parts of this plan does the planner think are parallel safe? And you can't tell. You can tell what it actually chose to put below the gather node, but that can be a costing decision. So I, I yes, I think there would be value in exposing some more of these That's bits. A bigger question, but how can we get information in the explain output about things that didn't actually get chosen? 
Well, no, I'm not talking about that. I mean, that's a, that showing alternative, completely alternative plans would be a whole different thing. But if you're just trying to judge which things could have been put under gather, knowing whether those plan nodes were marked parallel safe would, would be enough to tell you whether that was hypothetically possible. Um, knowing the plan node IDs is probably mostly useful for debugging, but we do do debugging sometimes. X param and all param are definitely interesting, again, at least if you're doing development. So I, I think it would be cool to have an extra mode that basically says, you know, don't deparse my expression so cleverly, just tell me what it really looks like um, and, uh, and show some of these other details that are probably mostly boring for users, although I think it's kind of useful to have some idea how it works so that you, 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 you don't get confused by the, the output. Um, but certainly for developers, uh, yeah, I think that would be handy. Yeah, it's definitely the case that if you do something like this, even on a plan tree this size, but certainly on a really long plan tree, if you have outer and inner references all over there, every instance of the word outer refers to something different, and every instance of the word inner refers to something different, unless they're on the same line. So yeah, that de there's definitely yeah, confusion possibility the there. I'm not sure that would be an improvement, but. <laughs> We can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, alternate subplan, what does that do? Alternate subplan, we uh, pick two different p plans for executing a subquery. I think usually one of them is a hashed subplan, which will be useful if we're going to execute it a whole bunch of times, and the other one is a non-hashed subplan, which will be better if we're only going to execute the subplan once or twice. And instead of figuring out that at plan time, we cheat <laughs> and leave it to the executor to decide which one it's going to do. It, it's kind of a hack, and, and I say that having asked Tom Lane about it yesterday, who said, that's kind of a hack. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, why not just set the plan tree then? Why do you need an index change? Because like, you can set it back and, and set up the plan tree. Right, so there's like a debug print plan, and it, d it dumps the raw node tree. Um, that is sometimes useful, but that is really verbose. Like, the, the node tree. Right. No, that's true. If you, if you turn on debug print plan, you get something that will absolutely tell you exactly what's in the plan tree. But my problem with that is for something like this, it's like 20 pages of output. So I'm no longer confused because explain is hiding stuff from me. I'm confused because I can't navigate through this enormous node tree. Like the, just a target list for a typical query is two or three pages long, and it gets hard to figure out Wait, am I still in the same list of var nodes, or am I now in the next list of var nodes? Right, but you'd also probably minimize it, like, the query a little bit. Because you're targeting for, for developers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's another way you could do it, yeah. I, I mean, there's certainly, we could do nothing. Like, we've managed to make PostgreSQL as good as it is today without doing anything here, <laughs> right? And you know, you have an idea of how to make it better, and that's cool, and I have a slightly different idea, and that's also cool. But, I, you know, I'm happy to hear anybody's ideas, uh, maybe not get into a long discussion right now, but I'm happy to hear anybody's ideas on how to improve this. Um, I, I just think that, uh, you know, this isn't the kind of output that you probably want to use for everyday debugging, but I think it's useful to know that this stuff is happening. Um, even during or ordinary uh, debugging, because it can make you less confused about what's g really going on here. And I think certainly for development, there are times when you'd like a little bit more, but maybe not something quite so throw pages and pages of ASCII at me as, uh, as, as debug print plan, which I have used, but only on address. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, rough web plane for developers, uh, I think it would make sense to implement, uh, to implement this as a We have done some things over the years to make it more possible to hook into explain output. So for example, we have custom scans 
and custom scan providers have some methods that they ca can call to show things and explain output. Doing this kind of thing, though, is definitely beyond the ability, uh, the extension capabilities that we have today. Um, part of it is this goes beyond explain. In order to generate this output that I'm showing you here, I had to hack ruleutils.c, not explain.c. Um, and so uh, it wouldn't be as simple as just providing an API and to explain if you really want to get this. You, you actually need some to pass some flags down to something much, much lower level. Or rewrite all of ruleutils.c uh, in your own extension, which, I mean, you could do. But. So I, I'm not actually sure that there's a very convenient way to execute this, to turn this into an extension. It could certainly be done. I mean, you could write a function, and you pass it a thing, and it generates a plan, and then you copy all of ruleutils.c, and copy all of explain.c, and change everything so that it produces this output. I mean, you could, you could do it in a couple days, right? It would just be hard to maintain, because as the upstream code changed, it, it, things would diverge. Um, if you have an idea of how to refactor it so that we can plug into it, uh, game, game for that, too. Um, I don't immediately see a way to do it, but there's lots of things that are good ideas that I don't know how to do. Um, I think we have time for like one more question, if anybody has one. Good, everything is perfectly clear. Okay, <laughs> thanks everyone.